Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Bandan Mars and Malaysia and Think City's first webinar in what will be a new series on relevant topics of interest. I'm the moderator for today. My name is Anand Krishnan. I'm a professional architect in private practice and a council member of Badan Warisan Malaysia. Badan Warisan Malaysia is Malaysia's leading NGO on built heritage. We have been in existence for over 25 years. And um, we invite you to check us out on our webpage. Some information was uh, uh, on the video that you just saw. We also invite those who have not who are not already a member to join us, to help us in our efforts uh, with our nation's built heritage. I'll give more de details at the end of the talk. Today's talk is about measured drawings. As you know, measured drawings are the backbone of restoration and conservation efforts. Our speaker this afternoon is Lin Teh Bing. He's an architect and, um, hang on. He's an architect and he, was, he studied, he did his architectural education in the UK and he comes from Kuala Lumpur and he's a professional architect in both Malaysia and the UK. He has extensive experience in conservation projects and has won awards for his work. He is a founding member of the Malaysian Institute of Interior Designers and has been a long time uh, member of the uh, of Baden Morris and Malaysia and a council member as well. His firm, Architect Shilpa, has done many, many projects throughout the years, and he's also taught widely. His other interests include photography, ikebana, the art of tea drinking, calligraphy, and the performing arts. Before we begin, some housekeeping matters. Please switch off your phones or have them in silent mode. The talk will go on for about 40 minutes or so. After that, we will have a a Q and A session. If you have any questions, use the chat button on your screen and um, ask the questions. Don't forget to uh, state your name and where you're from, and um, uh, it will be sent to to me, and I'll moderate all those questions. Um, these questions. Uh, this webinar is not an interactive uh, webinar, so um, I'll ask those questions on your behalf to the speaker. Well, we are about to begin. I I hope you've got your Tetarek and your preferred beverage of choice with you. Please relax uh, and be ready for an hour long heritage talk. Without further ado, please welcome Architect Tech Ben. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hi, hi Ben. How are you? I'm very, I'm very are you happy. Ready? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm very grateful that you decided to spend an afternoon with us on this uh, Saturday afternoon to listen to about, about how um, measured drawings and surveys, uh, why they feature in conservation work of our built heritage. Um, so we have a very short time of, of within an hour to to cover this very wide subject. So I shall launch straight into it. Um, so the, the outline of my talk is that I'll just describe it generally, and then I'll cite historical precedents, um, then followed by elements of the measured drawings and surveys, and then that's followed along by examples, both local and abroad, of uh, measured drawings and surveys. So now I would like to take you all back to an earlier period of time <laughs> before the advent of uh, photography. Now, in those days, if you were a traveler, uh, in traffic traveler, you traveled to exotic lands and you saw places of interest, uh, antiquity, places of antiquity, and you had to tell a story of what you saw and what you actually experienced in uh, uh, in your travels. So people resorted to, to using paintings, sketches, or written narratives of their experiences in their travels abroad about the culture and the peoples that they have Met along the way. Now, these are views, paintings of scenes in Penang in the early 1820s, our Pula Penang. On the left-hand side is a view of, say, Suffolk House, which was uh, Captain Francis Light's residence. And then these are scenes of the jungles and the uh, landscape. So it was actually a window into the world of, the, of, of that time before the advent of photography. 
and then you would record the things um, in as accurate a manner as possible. So if you were a botanist, I mean, somebody accompanying uh, Charles Darwin on his voyages abroad, when you came across some, some flora or fauna, you would actually describe it through your painting as accurately as possible, the, uh, the, the fruit of the flower, the fruit of the flower, and then the plant, the, the size of the tree, and, and it's, it's just an illustration of what it is. And it's very beautiful. These drawings, these Victorian botanical drawings are artworks in themselves. So let's now venture into the field of the built environment. So in Europe, um, a young gentleman finishing off his education after having gone to boarding school or in private uh, tutorship, would actually venture to the continent and go to the roots of his civilization, which they ascribe to Greece, ancient Greece. So he will make a, a pilgrimage to, say, the Parthenon or, uh, or the Acropolis, which is this piece of land uh, in, in the center of town, which is elevated, uh, this plateau. And he also visit the great sites uh, you know, in Rome, in Paris, all the great capitals, and, and and experience the life there. So when he he goes back home, he has to describe what he has experienced and what he has seen. You see. Um, so in the past, when when these um, travelers went to these ancient ruins, I mean, don't forget these buildings are now in ruin. It, it, some of these have been reconstructed. By that time, they just pieces of stone strewn all over the place. And the scale of the building was huge. You know, how would they describe it? How would they measure it? How would they know the proportion? How could they recreate it? So this is where a measured survey um, and drawings come into usefulness. So here's a clear picture on the left of the Parthenon. And through through the description of, of, the, draw, uh, of the building through their drawings, they could also discern certain ratios and, and proportions which, in which the building was built. So in this case here on the bottom left, there is a superimposed idea of the uh, Fibonacci series, which, which, which creates this golden rectangle proportions, which was what they believe was the Parthenon was, was designed to. That's why it looks beautiful in, 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 in European eyes. So here, here are paintings done by travelers um, to, to the Parthenon. Over, over the different periods of time, hundreds of years ago, that is. And you can see the scale of the building. So you you couldn't, how would you measure it? You would then use an, uh, geometry and you would use trigonometry and estimation, ways of, of scaling the building you know, to, to, to describe it in proportions, um, such that you, when you went back, you could describe to a, a builder to, to reconstruct something similar in your, in your home setting. So these are paintings of the Parthenon. And, and in the um, 16th century, there was this architect in Italy. His name was Andrea Palladio. And he, he wrote this book called The Four Books of Architecture, in which there were various diagrams and illustrations which described the buildings as were recorded on site you know, in the visits to these ruins. So on the left, these are just excerpts from that book, which I picked out to illustrate this talk. I've, I've actually uh, labeled them in red because um, unfortunately our platform here doesn't allow me to use a cursor to explain it. So you can see the details. On the bottom part of the drawing on the left, there's a plan, it's a cut section through the columns and then projected upwards is what's called an elevation or the front facade. Um, at the upper part, there's the details of the entablature, which is this piece of structure that spans between the um, columns and the um, uh, between the columns. So on the right, there's a bottom there, there is the plan, then projected into an elevation. And it shows an arch with, with, with a keystone and boussois bricks. So another illustration from that book would be, um, here's a more elaborate sort of a Corinthian capital. These are the classical orders of architecture in European architecture. There's a base plan. There's an elevation, and then there's a pilaster, which is an embedded column. A column that's embedded in the wall. The technical term is, we call it a pilaster. Then at the top of the, of the arch, there's a keystone that anchors the whole thing with gravity. The, the arch is, is held up, the stones, the solid stones are held up by this so-called keystone right in the center. Now, um, on the right, there are details. These are detailed drawings of the uh, measured survey. Now. 
What it implies is that each element, each aspect, each little detail is measured such that when you draw, you're starting with a blank piece of paper, you could actually measure it in whatever uh, system of measurement you're using, whether it's a fathom or whether it's a inch and yards or millimeters and meters, to, to describe what you've actually seen and uh, measured. So these are actually records now. The presentation here is um, an ink drawing, whereas when you're on the field, it's freehand sketches with handwritten notes. So here is, here's another two more pages, uh, one, one showing the base of a column on the left. It shows the elevation of the column base, and then at the top there, the whole, um, what you call it, the uh, column is truncated, and then there's a capital at the top, details of the capital of the column. So with these molding details, the constructor or the builder could recreate exactly what is there at these uh, ancient buildings, um, though at a different scale. Now you'll notice that there are no inches and yards and so on, but there's a system of ratios where the column base is how many times uh, the base is, is extrapolated up to the column to show the height. Huh? So on the right is the detail of doors and the window architraves with the cornices indicated. So, so, so people who were, who were in, their, in their homeland when they returned to the home could reconstruct all these ancient views. Now, I'll, I'll just like to take you all to, to the more boring part of this talk, but it is vital that we understand the technical terms that are used in uh, measured drawings. Um, a measured drawing is actually done in orthographic projection. That means all lines and features are drawn in scale as they actually exist. You measure everything correctly and then you, you, you draw it in scale. So there are three main types of uh, architectural drawings. One would be the plans, then the section, as well as an elevation. So what is a plan? A plan is actually a view looking through a horizontal slice of a building. You slice through the building as if with a, with a butter knife, you know, you just cut through the slab of butter and you look down and then a heavy line indicates where the plan slices through the walls and other significant features. So features beyond the, sli uh, beyond the slice are drawn in lighter lines, they're seen in elevation. So on the right side, on the left side of the, uh, is, is an illustration, what I indicated in red is the plan. So the cut section slices through this gray area, the dark gray area, which should be solid. There are solid masonry walls there. So that's the plan, a horizontal slice. Now a, a section is what is, as a vertical slice through the building, a heavy line indicates where the section bisects the floor, ceilings, and other features. Then on the left, bottom left, is what's called an elevation, which is a view of the vertical uh, surface of the building, you know, like a full front face or the back face or the side face of the building. Um, the French word for that is facade. Now, um, a Detailed drawings are usually large-scale drawings I've indicated to you just now uh, in the previous two slides showing structure and uh, de decorative elements. So here, here's a typical architectural uh, drawing which shows a cut section, it's a cross-sectional view. Now this one is not a measured drawing, it's actually a competition design for the uh, vestibule and grand staircase of the museum in France. But the idea is that I'm slicing through the building just to illustrate how the the construction drawings are done or uh, design drawings done. You can see a grand staircase going through a voluminous central space, um, leading you up to the uh, Piano Nobile, the, the noble plane at the first floor, and then the, the spaces that fill up this museum. So from the from the rough notes and your design elements, you, you compose this beautiful painting of a picture of your ideas that you have in your mind, your architectural concept is then put to paper. So in a sense, an architectural drawing is a bit like a musical score for a musician. You hear the sounds in your head, you can, you can, you can hear it very, very clearly, and you, you put down a notation uh, so that people can recreate the piece of music in your, in your head through your musical notation. So what's so special about measured drawings then? Well, measured drawings have many advantages over photographs because, you see, a, a building can only be seen on the surface if you took a photograph. Right? So certain views are not easily portrayed by photographs. So for example, the floor plans or sections, and certain things which are, which are hidden from view. I mean, you couldn't see how the building was constructed. You couldn't slice it. But with a, with a measured drawing, you could actually work out the composition of that wall, how, how, many, how thick is the, is the flooring material, 
sitting on a piece of structure in the street and so on and so forth. So that has a tremendous advantage over a photograph. Uh, the other thing is that the dimensions of uh, various building features can easily be determined from measure drawings. So when you're doing a conservation project where you're trying to restore a building that's been damaged to fire or whatever, um, or an earthquake, for instance, you could actually measure, you say how much brick it would be needed or how much uh, stone or what, what's the size of the beam and all that. So these are precise dimensions. Uh, we try and get it as accurate as possible so that the contractor can then make a, a tender or a bid for the project uh, with more accurate prices. So he's, uh, he's not caught out you know, where he is underpriced for his product. He cannot deliver the end product. So at the bottom here, there's a street elevation of a row of houses in um, Ohio in America. And that's uh, on the right hand side is a cover of uh, Andrea Palladio's uh, building. So finally, measured drawings are made by measuring every part of the building, each and every part of the building, and you convey this information in graphic form. So as I said, you know, your rough hand, handwriting, your rough notes is then translated into a, a beautiful drawing. It can be a working drawing like the one on the left, uh, or it can be rendered. That means it's, it's given a bit of color and texture and, and, and shadow to, to give it a sense of depth. Right? Uh, so, Measured drawings are basically very analytical in nature. They, they are, in a sense, the reverse of an architect's working drawings. Now, when you do, if, if you are a professional architect like I am and Anand is, we would visualize a building and then we will then draw up what we think the building should be like, you know. But in the case of uh, a measured drawing, it's the reverse. We are looking at a building that has been built. So we are actually recording what is an as built condition. That means circa, in this case, 2021. What is the condition of the building? Maybe half the building has been demolished you know, and replaced or it has been modified through the years. So we record it as is and we write down there that it was this recording was done circa 2021. In some cases where the ceiling is inaccessible, you can't go into the ceiling, the roof space rather, um, because there's a ceiling. So we, we actually leave that space blank and say inaccessible. So you, you do not, you, you can of course speculate in, in your design, you actually say that we speculate that the structure would be like this, but it, everything is faithfully recorded. Now, these drawings also measure and record the numerous quirks that old buildings exhibit. Now, that's a charm about old buildings. They're never perfect, they're handmade, or they're, uh, and then you, you actually have to accept the fact that the, the, the walls are never true. They're not at right angles to each other. The whole building could be skewed at them obtuse angle or almost like, like a like a parallelogram you know so you you measure that you and you record it so the building is angled differently draw it as is you see so if the floor is uneven and the walls are out of plumb you describe it exactly as it is so that's what we mean by measured drawing now i would like to take you now on a, on a journey through, through through the whole world really um, to see how you would approach to measure a big building like this now, today's talk is not so much on the techniques, huh? uh, though we can cover that on another occasion. This one is more, let's say you were a traveler, you know, in 1571, this building was built, uh, designed by Andrea Palladio. And that's why this style of building, uh, neoclassical uh, uh, Renaissance building, uh, are called Palladian Villas. Now, this is a beautiful villa in Vicenza in Italy, and it's called the Villa Capra or the, the, or, or the La Rotonda, because of the rotonda in the center of the building. Now you come, you come across this building. How do you scale it? How do you measure it? You can't be putting scaffolding up to put, and put a tape against it. So you have to extrapolate, use your, your sense of mathematics and geometry to project and uh, and scale this building up and measure it up. So so this is what happens. You know, um, if if the building had 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 brick walls, you could count the bricks as they go up the facade to to indicate the size. In this case, these are. Uh, stucco, you know, there's a plaster over the brick, so to, to simulate the idea that it's a stone building, you have a bit more difficulty there. Now, here's a rendering done by some somebody else, I am, there's no name to it, but um, it is a rendering of, of a measured drawing done as accurately as possible of that very same building I mentioned just now. Now, in Palladio's book itself, on the left and on the right, is his design concept. All right, it was done not as a measured drawing, but it's it, in a sense it could work as a measured drawing because 
it's a series of proportions. You notice that there's no um, dimension given to how wide or how how high and so on. So this is a composite drawing. The one on the top is a plan. It's a square plan, a cruciform square plan. Um, on the bottom, there is on the left hand side a part part elevation, and on the right hand side, on the bottom left, uh, bottom right is a cross section to the building. So it's two combined in one. And on 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 the uh, right hand side is an illustration of what the building actually looks like on the site. Now here is a our modern version. We have a drone. Okay, we have a, now gone one one step higher. We have a drone. You can fly and give you an aerial view of the building. But in those days, you couldn't see that. You, know, you had to imagine it, right? Um, so the person on site would actually do a series of pencil sketches to give a sense of place, give a sense of the delicacy of the building, the, the ambience of the place. Then later on, in, in the comforts of his studio, he will draw up the plan based on his measurements and the proportions. So the center figure is the ground floor plan of the same building. On the right-hand side at the upper part, is a uh, cutaway exonometric. That means it's a 3D rendering of the building with, with as if it's cut out so you could spy into the building, you know, like a doll's house, a giant doll's house. Now, all this is, is able, is, is being, can be conveyed through the measured drawing because of the field data that has been gathered on site. You have to go and take the data, measure it, uh, see the sun angle, and so on and so forth, all that on site. And then only then can you retrieve it. So measured drawings, um, plan sections and elevations are very essential. You must include it in a documentation project. So the idea of conservation is that we have these beautiful relics from the past. Um, they have heritage value for whatever reason. It could be because it is a wonderful piece of architecture, or it could be associated with a famous personality who had lived or in that building. Or it could have been a famous event had, had, had some association with the building. For that reason, we would like to conserve it and for future generations. Therefore, a measured drawing is part of this portfolio where we record it so for a permanent record uh, of these precious buildings. So plans should be drawn first, starting with a foundation plan, followed by a floor plan, extruding it upwards, uh, and a gallery or loft when applicable. And finally, there's a roof plan. Now, cross sections, sections are more difficult to execute because they typically the most valuable to have because they show the whole composition of the building. Um, they not only reveal the overall dimensions, they also show the interior dimensions, uh, proportions, finishes, and often the wall, roof and roof floor drawings. So you could describe it. You've actually written annotations on the side of the drawing describing what the material is, whether it's dressed stone or ashlar work or it's just a brickwork or it's plastered work and so on and so forth. Now, you usually cut two sections to a building, what's called a longitudinal section for the longer dimension and one across the shorter dimension, which is called the cross section. So complex buildings, because of the lay of the land uh, cascading down with different levels, may need more sections to record the various features. Now, on the left is a beautiful drawing uh, rendered. It shows uh, the elevation plus part cross section on the left, both left and right of the building, showing the, the slice vertically through the structure. And right at the bottom is the uh, plan. You can see the three columns indicated at the bottom extruded upwards. Now, this is part of uh, the Ashmolean and Taylorian Institute in Oxford. Um, okay, now let's adjourn to another country, you know, if you're intrepid traveler and you're have the good fortune to go to Iran. These are wonderful ancient towers, you know, with intricate designs, arabesque patterns. The, the, the ancients at that time were very precise in, in the geometry. They could fit the pattern perfectly. You know, in modern style of uh, the design, we find that there's this lack of tolerance given, and we find they always cut tiles which don't fit the pattern. It goes out of pattern. When, and it goes around a circle or whatever. The ancients, what they did was that they did a series of proportioning using circles and squares and derived all these fabulous uh, arabesques through um, handling this um, this pattern. They, they, could, they, could see the, they could see the pattern in that. So these tomb towers in Karahan in uh, Iran, um, 
also uses these circles and squares. Can you see this a circle and square? And from there, you derive this uh, double rotated square, the outer outline of it, or the star of Bethlehem. And you can see that motif in this door on the on the left, or on the right, uh, plus some 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 detailed moldings, plans uh, of, of another building, plus this um, tile frieze on the side. So in, in, in Arabic buildings, or rather buildings from the Middle East, um, they, they would follow a system of cutting the tiles to fit the pattern. They would set out the building, and then they would then cut the colored tiles to fit. So it's always a perfect match. Now, in America, you have, say, a building like the Boston Public Library in Massachusetts. There's a front, front view of it, the front facade. Now, the working drawing, or rather the S-built drawing on the left, is, um, is a reproduction of that. It's all scaled down, but it's perfectly in scale, each element uh, in relation to another. So it shows the, uh, the front gate in the center, uh, the, uh, the arches on the first floor, and then the roof details, the cornices, and so on. Now, there's another very famous tower, which was the Tribune Tower, which was for this uh, newspaper, a very famous newspaper in Chicago. And you can see the, the entrance hall with stone. There was an entrance hallway, um, arch portico. Um, here's the drawing on the right, showing the very same element of the architecture. Um, and it's all reduced to a beautiful poster. You can you can frame it and put it on your on your wall. You know, it's a wonderful work of art because it's it's to scale. In this case here, there are dimensions on the left on the edge of the drawing, and uh, they actually tell you how big it is. So it's the entrance lobby, entrance detail. And then the same tower at higher level with very gothic uh, details of the stone work is beautifully illustrated here. You can see the silhouette of the of the cut form, and it's exquisitely done. The line weights, you know, the way the drawing gives you a sense of depth. You could feel that the, the drawing is not very flat; it's two-dimensional. Now, mind you, these drawings were done in the nineteen, I believe, the nineteen thirties. Um, so they were all hand-drawn. It was before the advent of computer-aided design, uh, CAD drawings. So you'll find that there's a certain delicacy. Now, here's a lady standing on the parapet wall to give you a sense of the scale of the building. And here's another one in New York, this one in Chicago, and again, the similar style of presentation where you have um, the tower at the top, the uh, facade, the exterior details, the moldings, and so on. Now, in England, this very famous building, St. Paul's Cathedral in London, this is where uh, Princess Diana got married, uh, and other famous personalities as well. So this is Sir Christopher Wren's uh, great monument, and uh, he um, got it built between 1675 and 1710. Now, imagine you didn't have any drawings of the building and you uh, you had to record it. So where do you start? Where do you actually start? You start from one corner of the building, faithfully measure it, and then cross-check your dimensions to make sure that the hole is, uh, fits in. Okay, So that's a, this is the same building, the facade seen from the west. Now let's go to Nepal. Now in Nepal, this is a very old uh, Buddhist temple, uh, Chusya Bahal, and um, in the 1649, so 17th century Buddhist uh, temple, a simple two-story structure. Um, this is the inner courtyard. Um, there you are. So these are drawings done by the architecture school um, in Nepal. Um, on the left is a ground floor plan. It shows a series of cellular rooms um, that, that encloses the courtyard in the center. So at the bottom is the main entrance, and then there are some features in the center, which you saw in the picture. Then on the right-hand side is the upper floor plan, and as, as described earlier. The gray area, the shaded gray area, is a structure. So where you see indentations and you see the uh, there's where the windows are, are cut out in, and light is allowed into the building. So from, from a plan, an architect or anybody in construction will be able to guess or be clear about how the construction is done. Yeah? It's carefully measured up. So this is a 17th century building recorded in architectural terms. Now, when they constructed at that time, I don't think there were construction drawings like this. They were, 
this is very much an European invention of uh, a measured drawing. Here is a cross section on the left, a cross section the, to the to the building, and then at the bottom left is also a front elevation of the building showing the windows at the first floor, and on the bottom floor is all solid masonry. There's um, more privacy. On on the left and right shows the actual thing on the site. Now this is another building in the in the same square. These are UNESCO World Heritage sites. Huh? with ancient monuments uh, in Kathmandu. This is the Kashta Mandapa. Now, in 2015, there was a terrible disaster of this earthquake that brought down a lot of this building. But thankfully, there are records done, which gives you a, an opportunity to try and recreate or repair or restore it to its former glory. Now, this Kashta Mandapa is a public building. Um, and then you can see an, on the plan here, the ground floor plan, there's a series of columns, you know, a colonnade that circumambulates, either you can circumambulate the building. Right in the center, there's a core, which is where the dark gray area is, that supports the upper story. And uh, to the left, you can see a staircase that, that brings you up to the upper level. So it's 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 a sort of a tower, um, a three-tier tower. Now, on the bottom level of the drawing, you'll notice there's a scale. It's what we call a bar scale relative to the to drawing, how much an inch would represent uh, in the dimension there. So the, here's the cross section of the same building, a south-north section uh, on the left. You can see the earth at the bottom. There's a series of steps that lead you up to the first to the, to the ground floor. And inside that the huge space, there's a double height space with a staircase leading you up and then going up to the, to the upper block in the second floor. And um, on the right, we have an elevational building elevation of the building, showing you the, the front view of the building with, with the two stone lions also shown. So basically, it's, a, it's an accurate depiction of what is on site at that time when they measured the building. Um, of course, over a period of time, I think they, they would have added certain things, you know, gate, metal gates. And, you know, the, it was a tourist haunt, and uh, so they had to put in some more features. But with your field notes, you could recreate as it was at that time. Now in China, we have the same situation again. This is a Longxing Temple in Hebei in the province of China. This is about a thousand years old, this, this structure. On the left, you can see a rough sketch. And these are just fairly rough sketches of a river. And there's a cross section at the upper part of the drawing, um, a plan at the middle, and um, on the... Um, Next one, this is the actual building. So imagine this building was built a thousand years ago. You've got no record of the building. How in heavens are you going to record it? So you start somewhere. Anyway, here's another building, the Nanshan Temple. It's one of the oldest buildings still existing, a timber structure from uh, 782 CD. It, it came down and it was reconstructed again from, from, from their records. So just give an idea. Now, a freehand sketch would be like something like this on the site, you know, where the parts are described, their names given to each and every one of the elements that composes the building, from the, the raised platform to the front entrance, the lintel, the columns, and so on. Now, this is the actual building. Uh, these are views taken with, with the modern convenience of a photograph to show how complicated the structure is. So you had to record it in some way, measure it. Now, the, the complex on the right shows the uh, site plan. On the left is an engineering sketch which won a prize for a student in, uh, in UCL in London. Um, here, here are details of the same building, part elevation, part section. There's a plan and there's also an elevation. Some of the, the statuary inside the building. Now, with the same notes, you can also do a three-dimensional perspective sketch of the structure. And here's showing the Great Hall in Fuquang um, Monastery. Here's the same building uh, or, or another building by the side, showing the short section, a long section, another short section in the plan. Now, in, in vernacular architecture, this is a common folk architecture for the houses and even some of the public buildings as well. There are details, details which are recorded um, through measurement as well. So these are the end, the so-called gable ends between the, the roof uh, with different, different tops. You know? Um, some looking like walk ears and so on. The feng shui elements are also described here. Um, 
Okay, let's then venture into the Sucho Gardens, a very famous um, landscape architectural gardens. Uh, so, sorry, the famous gardens in, in, in Sucho. Now, these gardens date back to the 16th and 18th century. And, um, and these drawings were done by Nanjing School Architecture. Now, I just put some pictures to show you how complex the, the site can be how the Chinese garden was very freeform and mysterious. There's no beginning and no ending and, and how you could make it uh, clear, you know, to, to somebody like us seated far away from it to understand how the building was done. So here's an example of a simple square, square pavilion, the Changlang team. Um, that's an elevation drawn with after scale measuring it and the bottom left obscured by my picture is the uh, plan. On the uh, left is a cross section showing the little lean to along the walkway and uh, a 3D projection of it, plus the full elevation, the full frontal, where you go up three steps and then you enter the covered walkway. Now, the folio was about 30, 40 years old, so it's a bit yellow in the background. But you can see the delicacy of the painting. Here's a hexagonal shaped pavilion in one of the many gardens there that I have in my portfolio, uh, folio of, that, of, of the drawings. So this one shows the plan. Now you notice there's a north sign. You can show the orientation of the building. You see the scale. You see a cross section showing how the furniture is even laid out, uh, how high the, the ceiling is, plus the king post and all that. So here's an elevation of the building with the trees. What is beautiful about these drawings was that they actually drew as close to reality with the trees. It wasn't a stylized tree. It was actual real tree. Now here's another beautiful pavilion in the uh, humble administrative garden in Sucho. Um, there's a real pavilion. These are pictures of it. Done. And here's the efforts done by the Nanjing School of Architecture. Here's a cross section showing the platform. The plan shows a, a walkway leading to the octagon, uh, octagonal space. Here's a cross section showing the water level, plus the stones as obscuring the columns that holds up the structure. You can see the balustrades are, are lean to. Eh? Here's another view where you're entering the main entrance of this pavilion. But you can see the plants. What is beautiful about this drawing, I find, is that they actually draw the palms. They show each and every rock as close to the reality as it is. Here's another one, a hexagonal shaped pavilion. Uh, the plan is very telling. It tells you the extent of the, root, the, the trees, the, the canopy cover in the circles around there, the steps leading up there, and so on and so forth. So here's a covered walkway looking up the pond and here rendered in the drawing form. So there's a plan at the bottom part and there's an elevation of the same walkway uh, depicted through real measurement. So the circle that you see at the bottom of the plan shows the canopy, the extent of the canopy of the trees are shading it. Now you will see these drawings were probably done in winter, that's why the trees are naked. Um, there are also field sketches showing how the construction is. So this, this sweeping roof with columns and um, you have uh, all the different elements, the pearlins and so on and so forth. So there, these are details of the drawing of the pavilions and uh, more details. So every bit of the construction is taken apart, imagined and measured up. So you show the details of how the roof was put together. Now, from the field survey that they did, they, they got so much information that they can draw in the luxury of their studio, uh, comforts of their studio. They can draw the plan. You notice that the building is following the topography of the land. And, and here's a 3D exonometric showing the building as depicted with the trees. Very beautiful drawings. Then there are also cross sections right across the, the uh, gardens, which shows you the different levels, how the terrain come to play when the placement of the uh, buildings are there. Now, all this is revealed through getting the data and drawing it to scale, right? There are no records uh, existing prior to this of these buildings. So here's another cross section going through the building. Uh, the, the, one on, the one on the left was actually the plan where the cross sections are taken. Now here's a view of the garden, a very mysterious garden, no beginning, no ending. You slip into it and you're in a different world altogether. And here's a cross section through the um, same building. You, you recognize these drawings in the center of this now, the two buildings. Um, right across to the sides, so we can see the ups and downs, plus the water features, plus the trees. Now, inside one of these beautiful pavilions, this is a typical pavilion, is very poetically called the Drifting Fragrance Hall. 
Um, there are glass traceries all along the sides, beautiful filtered light coming through. Now, you have to record it. So people would do, uh, the students or, or, or the professional would actually measure up the building, uh, the, the timber frames and show the cross-section of it, the elevation of it, plus the plan showing how the door swings. So these are three sets of uh, opening casement doors, uh, full, full doors. And uh, on the left, these are sections of the com timber components that make up the screen. So technically speaking, I could recreate the screen if I can get the same quality of craftsmanship to, to, to build it again. And here are the examples of uh, timber screens in elsewhere. Now, quickly, we're going to swing across to Turkey now to show this very famous building by Sinan, who was a uh, celebrated architect, Mima Sinan, from, from previous centuries. And this is in Turkey. It's a beautiful building. It's a mosque. Um, and uh, this is 16th century building. And the University of Venice had some students do a series of beautiful, absolutely beautiful building, uh, drawings of this famous building. Um, here's a composite of uh, elevation, section, and plan at two levels. Now, just to give you an idea of the inside of that building, is a very complex building, in, but the space here is beautiful. Um, with lights showering in. This is taken at night in the central space. And here's the entrance courtyard to give you an idea. And if you look up, you can see the two minarets, uh, the four minarets framing the building. Now, when it's depicted in plan, this is what it looks like. It, it, there, you can see on the left, these blue colored columns in the center forming a circle, but it's a circle inscribed within a square. And then there's a series of rooms around it. And then on the outside is the courtyard with a blue circle where the ablution uh, space is. Anyway, looking up, this is what the ceiling looks like. Beautiful, solid stone, you know, and held there. Look, uh, magic, no hands. <laughs> and it, it supports itself beautifully. Now, how would you draw it? So, so when you draw it, it, it's rendered in color to make it clearer to someone reading the plans to understand how the structure is constructed. So here you have the abutments where the where the dome is, is pro, pro, projecting from and the surrounding rooms. And on the right-hand side, there's another upper floor of showing the domes, the upside of the corner. Now here's a very interesting drawings. Again, using the same data, you're having a worm's eye view, a cutaway exonometric, looking from the bottom as if you're a worm on the ground, looking at the dome and then the construction from the bottom. And on the right is an elevational drawing which shows the, the depth of the structure through the shadows and the light. So the bottom is the plan. Then you have um, other drawings here of the um, building sacred geometry. So what happens is that when you have um, a series of buildings like this, I'm sorry, I have to run a bit faster because I'm running out of time. Um, you have this cut away uh, from, from your field data. You then do these exquisite drawings, but you can also find out relationships, the proportions from one to the other, and you'll notice that there are a lot of sacred geometry involved, uh, the whole sphere within there. Here's the minaret, the construction of the minaret in spirals, each step going out, spiraling up to the top. Um, and then here in America, you have a, a group of people who did a series of surveys, the Historic American Building Survey, where they measured in the 1930s a series of famous buildings um, in their details in this architectural drawing. So Mount Pleasant, there's the details in the library showing the door, cornices and so on. Even in engineering structure like this, a deep windmill, you have uh, the front facade, the side view, um, and then even the construction inside is recorded. This is a separate group of people called Historic American Engineering Record. They measured the building up and they did that. So it's a cross-section. Then coming back home in Malaysia, many, many years ago, my office was involved in recording some two shop houses in uh, Kamung China, in, in Dan Banda, and when, when in 1998 it was listed by Washington as uh, World's Monuments Watch list of 100 most endangered species, uh, sorry, endangered sites where they're in danger of destruction. So we, we faithfully measured up and drew up for the contractor to price. So here's the cross section to a typical Chinese shop house in, in Kuala Tungano along the Kampung China, Dan Banda. So the front is with the five foot base on the right hand side. So here's another view of the uh, side alley um, where the cracks are also indicated to show the plaster work, the damage to the plaster work. Um, here's a rear view of the, uh, of 
the, of the assembly. And then with our proposal where all these un, unsightly lean to structures were dotted line to shown to be removed. So we use our data to compose a construction uh, tender document on how to go about the construction work. So we have a delabitation survey. You need to do a conduct a survey to show the condition as it is, uh, the state of this repair. And that's what we call a condition or delabitation survey. Here there are notes on the side and return company photographs. Um, there's a view of the lane of that building. Um, and then again, the state of this repair. So you had to analyze the building when the additions were added on. Now in uh, 2009, around that time, the University of Malaya together with the National University of Singapore had a joint measure drawing studio, which they conducted in three or four towns and cities in, uh, in Malaysia. This one was uh, uh, in Taiping where some buildings were singled out, uh, worthy of conservation, uh, worthy of recording, and uh, so the students did site measurements. They they had uh, verbal dis uh, discussions with the owners, tried to find out the history of the building, who commissioned it, who built it, what it was built for, and so on and so forth. And so they could trace the oral history through oral history and archival material. They showed the understanding of the building as well, such that they could. Here's another building of uh, there are three or four buildings done of each town. Um, no records before, so the level here is a cross section to the site, such that you could actually make a full model of it to scale of the construction. Uh, we had we had exhibitions held in National University of Singapore uh, Museum, to and then invited the owners to, to see their building in miniature. It's quite exciting for them. Um, here's this Mubi's house, a famous personality in Taiping, um, and so on. So. There you are. I'll just run through. That's it. So, so these are cut sections right through the whole of town. Now, so in conclusion, measured drawings are aesthetic and very functional. They form, uh, they are very accurate in the details. So more than blueprints, they, they are graphically pleasing and well-designed, and they contain the nature of the place they're describing. They are very important, but they are part of a condition survey. That means you have to do the histories, to check the history of the building, how it was used, what it was used, may have a change of use. To understand the context of the town or the village or, or the space that it's occupying. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the little introduction. That was fantastic, uh, um, Dan. And um, I think um, everyone definitely enjoyed it. I certainly did. And, and um, now we move on to some questions and answers. So we've got a, a number of questions that, that uh, uh, everyone has, a few people have sent in. So perhaps I, I can read them and uh, Bain, if you could answer them. Hang on. The first question is from uh, Chi Sing from Kuala Lumpur. So the question is, what your take on using 3D computer modeling technology to create a modern version of measured drawings. An example is the amazing 3D building models modeled by traditional building enthusiasts using softwares like SketchUp. Do you think modern technologies can be used to complement the traditional measured drawing method, especially for the understanding and preservation of intricate heritage buildings? Thank you. Um, very good question indeed. I, I think there's a place for, for computers into our drawing. We are not afraid of new technologies. In fact, it's very useful. You can you can see a fly through and cut away exonometric. The only proviso is that make sure the drawing is accurately measured. That means you do not straighten out a crooked wall. There's a tendency for a lot of students who or enthusiasts using AutoCAD drawings, uh, automated drawings, eh, computer aided drawings to straighten a, a, a wall that is askew and not straight. You, you also get lazy, you, know, you, you assume that each bay, let's say there are 10 bays of, of, of a structure, you, you just assume all of them are the same. Actually, it's not. It's, it's not consistent. When you construct it on site, things happen along the way, and then you, you, you're short of space. So it's never true. You have to be as accurate as you can. You've got to draw it as is. I've seen perhaps uh, drawings where it's very accurate. The road, the, the, the road is skewed, it's shown is skewed. If the, if the bridge is built a little bit too to the left, it's done exactly as this. So do use the computer-aided drawing to help you, but do not 
do not assume things. You, the, the, the machine will replicate it for you, but it's never true. We are not doing construction drawings. We're doing as-built drawings. Just remember that. So you draw it as accurate as you can. And then also the delicacy of rendering to make it more alive. When the computer drawing is very dead to me, it's very flat, very engineered, um, doesn't have the atmosphere. Excellent, excellent. The second question is from uh, Aida Afina. I'm not sure where she's from, but um, she says, I'm sure you must have uh, you must have used various software and methods in preparing your measured drawings. Can you suggest the best one? So I'm not sure uh, whether there's a the, the measured the, the CAD we did was straightforward. This was done in the 2009, uh, around the time, 1998. We just used simple AutoCAD, all right? It, the, the thing about a, a measured drawing is this. These buildings were built before the time of computers. You know, I mean, people like Clay Frank and Wright built uh, huge, beautiful pieces of architecture. The Taj Mahal was built without a computer. So you should go back to traditional methods of construction, traditional methods of measuring. I mean, I had the privilege of visiting the, the monument. And it just amazed me that the very families that built the structure are still living there and carrying on a tradition in the repair of the building. They, they are repairing it exactly as it was built 300 years ago. So you 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 just use the simplest software. Now, I like uh, pencil and T-square, especially on site, because, you know, if it rains, don't forget our weather here is not very... Uh, <laughs> it, it rains in the middle of the night or it rains in the late afternoon and all your drawings are washed out because you use ink, you see. So I like I like pencil. You can, you can make a correction by just rubbing it off. So these are things that you, you pick up along the way. And I find that a traditional building should be measured a traditional way. So do not, if a building is, is done in feet and inches, an imperial scale, and a person's outstretched arm is six foot, you know, then you don't convert it to, uh, to metric because there's incremental error. So over a long distance, of, uh, when you convert, convert, convert the dimensions, you add an extra six inches at the end of that long facade, you know, to just conversion uh, error. So my point is that draw it as you can, but I found AutoCAD is fine. AutoCAD is fine, it's good enough. You don't need those fancy uh, architecture. You see the beauty about these drawings, it teaches you to visualize in your mind. So the architect can see from plan section elevations, a three-dimensional image in his mind. All okay, right. The, the next question, uh, Bain, is from Mohammad Khairul Azim. Again, I'm not sure where he's from. Okay. But uh, he also uh, is uh, wants to know about technology. So uh, he wants to know about the LIDAR laser scanning method and photogrammetry. Well, pho photogrammetry is that where, where, where they used to take a camera, you know, a, a parallel, you know, they, they, you know, the elevation is that there's no distorting perspective. Your eyes will make a, a vanishing point, right? So, so you see a view of a, of a building always uh, vanishing at the end. So what you do is that when you do photogrammetry, you go vertically up, like almost like now what drone photography can do. And it's frame by frame, you know, you compose the whole picture. Photogrammetry is used. In fact, when we measured those buildings with the joint studio at UMNUS, we actually used a tower crane, you know, we, we commissioned a crane such that the students were lifted up to the roof level and they could actually measure or do a rubbing of the moldings. Um, laser technology, but as I said, you know, the construction is a very, it's not a perfect fit, if you know what I'm saying. You know, I can have a factory-made metal window, but when I actually insert it into the brick wall, there's this gap, you know, which is like an inch of gap, which is filled with putty. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if it's like 0.25 millimeter accuracy because the, the tolerance is in the putty that fills up the gap between the two. So you, you can never get precise. You don't have to be too worried. It's, it's a loose fit, I would say. Uh, it's almost like fuzzy logic, man. You 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 don't don't get too obsessed with making a laser precision. You know, I had I had a situation on site where the the the, the windows came and you were miles away from <laughs> on the brick wall that you're supposed to fit in. Okay. Okay. Good. The next question is from Ravi Shankar. Um, he wants to know about some of the work that you did in Kuala Trunganu, the shop houses. Um, was the measurements done based on observation or physical measurement? Uh, they, were, they were done on physical measurement. Um, we were commissioned to do just those two shop houses. There was another firm, uh, I think it was GDP, who did the master plan for the whole area and made our proposals. Now, we are frantically 
measuring a building up. There was the Chinese temple in this shop house, which was being demolished the very next day. So we are measuring up this afternoon for something that will go, you know, <laughs> in, in the next day. So it, it was a terrible rush, but we did the best we could. But the sad part of the story is that the whole rear portion was completely reclaimed so that, that the water frontage just went, and which is very, very sad. Uh, and there were other, other things that, that damaged the fabric of the old ancient town. Good. We've got two, uh, two final questions, uh, two short ones. The, the, the first one is um, based on your teaching experience. Uh, this is from Ko Jing Hao. And uh, based on your teaching experience, uh, Bain, what are the challenges of conducting measured drawing as a subject in school? I think it's, I usually tell my students is the very first job you do as an architect, as a professional or people involved with it, is, is, to, is to do a measured drawing. You see, I mean, your, your aunt comes to you and say, Bain, can you, can you do my, my, my house, I'd like do a new house for me or do a little kitchen extension for me? And I said, yes, I'd love to do it, auntie, you know, but do you have any drawings? And then she'll tell you, I'm sorry, no drawings, you see. So where are you going to start? You've got to measure up what is, and then you propose your extension or whatever. Now, always remember this, when you go to a place like Ikea, they arm you, they fortify you with a measuring tape so that you can actually do a, a dry run and measure whether the furniture is going to fit into your room or into that little alcove. Now, that's what a measured drawing is. You have to measure up, do a triangulation to get it precise because the building can be skewed. Do as many triangle measurements, eh, the diagonal, and also draw it on plan, a rough plan, cut it to size, and just move your furniture around. You have to do that process. So measure drawings are immensely important. You also have to guess where the pipe work is going and you know, all the hidden M&E services and all that. So if you don't have that facility as a designer, you're hampered. You cannot, even a modern building. Now, modern buildings, say, 50 years ago, are still worthy of conservation. I mean, our, our, our national, you know, uh, mosque, for instance, was built, you know, 60, 63, you know, and 67 or that. They are worthy of conservation. So you have to, you know, even a modern building, you've got to be aware of what is. And you have to measure up that. You, you can't just assume that it was built as per the architect's intentions. Good. Another, another related question, uh, Bain, is mm -hmm. uh, from Nankula Uta Berta. Um, she wants to know, or he or she wants to know, um, if you could conduct um, measured drawings during the pandemic, how do you do that? You, you could, you could. You see, you see, the pandemic is just the bug. The bug, basically, the bug is everywhere. You have to take precautions by, you know, doing all the yeah, SOPs exactly. that are recommended. But the most important thing I must to share with the audience is this. You are dealing with old structures. Usually, sometimes they're in a very derelict state of disrepair. And they pose a danger. All construction sites, mind you, are dangerous structures. Now, so you have to employ a, what's called a buddy system, you know, like the way when they go scuba diving. You don't go scuba diving on your own. If you go into trouble, get into trouble, nobody can help you, you see. So you always tell people, look, I'm off to measure this building. I'll be back by 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, or you get somebody to come along with you and you take full precaution. There was this terrible tale many, many years ago, this English uh, in, in, in England. Uh, this young architect, this girl, went to measure this old Norman tower, you know, 12th century or whatever, uh, tower for an old church which was derelict. And the platform gave way under her. The whole floor collapsed under her and she died. She died and nobody knew where she was for three days. You know, they couldn't recover the building. So my, 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 my point to you is it's not the COVID. It's not the small little virus. The virus, you protect yourself by building up your immune system. It's like the flu. Don't, don't fall prey to the flu that year because of your stress. So you just protect yourself by having a good immune system. Likewise, with architecture, you don't get so enthusiastic at the old building. You take one step back off the platform and you fall off. You know, you're at great height and you, you damage your spine. So all sites are dangerous. Take all necessary precautions. Arm yourself with tapes. There are equipment you can use. You have a profile gauge to, to show how the profile of the, of the molding is done, measured accurately. You have a, a good length of tape. You Now we have laser tapes, laser measurement. We use a laser light to measure it. So don't be lazy. You just measure it five times. You, know, you don't just do one reading and that's it. It's like your blood pressure. If you read it wrongly, you can do it again. So just go to the exercise. Two, do each measurement twice, the height and the length, and using your laser. So use the best of the modern equipment. And now the best is actually the drone. The drone can fly you through everywhere. There was a recent one which impressed this uh, uh, 
Californian, uh, these Hollywood uh, directors. This this drone flew through a, a bowling alley, went yes. to the back of the bowling yes. alley, where this car. I mean, that's amazing exploration of space, you know. I mean, there you are. So couldn't you do that with a modern building and get all the information that you wanted behind the scene? Yeah. Good, good. Okay. Um, there, there's there's been many questions, and and uh, because of time, um, we are really sorry we can't uh, get all the questions uh, out to architect Wayne. But yeah. um, the last question is actually something that perhaps I could answer. Uh, someone, um, Nicholas, he's asked about uh, whether any of the material that you've shown in your slides is it available. Um, uh, as public access, or can he uh, download? Oh, yes, I mean, it's, uh, most most of the materials are available at, at our Baden Watson. Join our organization. We have yes. a resource, uh, resource yes. library there, Chen Wun Fi, the resource library there, with all this ample material. And the idea is that the uh, all ultimate objective is to preserve these uh, heritage buildings. These are our weapons, you know, our our arsenal of equipment. So join us as a member, get access to this information. Certain things, because I, I, I published uh, through these slides is because the university they, is meant to educate, so I, I don't mind sharing you. Some of these are in my private collection, those portfolios. Yeah. And so, uh, but the quick, the short answer is uh, to, to anyone who wants to know, uh, this particular set of slides um, are not available uh, for downloading. No, they're not available for downloading. I would suggest that this, I, I, I believe this session is being t videotaped. Correct. So come and watch it again. And yes. then you can also get in touch with me. I can try and help you as much as I can. You know, okay, excellent. So on, on that note, um, yep. um, we finished the, the webinar. And um, the next few slides, uh, we'll, we'll talk about um, what we at Baden Warisan wants to do. And that's uh, uh, it's, it's an initiative to increase our membership, and especially among students. So uh, thank you, Bain. Uh, uh, and, and those who are still here, please stay on. And we'll just show a few more slides and videos. Thank you so much. OK. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right. So uh, um, we've got um, a reduced membership for students. And it's a wonderful way to, to join a, a heritage um, NGO that looks into uh, buildings for conservation and, and restoration. There are many, many things that Baden and does so uh, we are we're targeting students and now the students don't have to be only from uh, architecture or planning or construction programs it can be any student if you are interested in buildings if you're interested in in heritage and, and you like to uh, be part of the initiatives that, that we do then please join in it's it's very very good um, for one year we're going to waive the uh, entrance fee and and uh, Subscription is only twenty dollars for one whole year. So, um, uh, if you are please apply, please go to the uh, web page and, and um, you can um, download all the membership forms there. So uh, you can be a member. The, the web page is uh, on the left hand side, valenwarisan.org.my, um, and we are also targeting people um, who would like to donate as well. We are a self funding. Uh, NGO and, and uh, any form of help, uh, financial help or support is always welcome. So uh, you can download this page uh, in the chat group. I think um, it's going to be um, placed there shortly. But um, uh, you can use Maybank and um, there's a account number there. And, and please donate. It would be really helpful um, for us. So thanks for supporting us. So uh, on that note, um, I'd like to thank, uh, I guess that the whole thing is over, but I'd like to pay some thank yous to a number of people. I'd like to thank the speaker, uh, Thich Bain, um, Johnny Yu from Think City, the president of Biden Boys and Malaysia, Lim Wei Ling, our general manager, Vincent, Vanessa Lung, and finally, all of you for attending this webinar. Thank you so much, and um, we hope to see you for the next webinar. Um, We'll, we'll start marketing this once we start planning for it further. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend.